It's the Real News Network. I'm Greg Wilpert coming to you from Quito, Ecuador. Teachers are striking, or walking out as some call it, in states around the country, West Virginia, Oklahoma, Kentucky, Arizona, and this week in Colorado. Until now, the walkouts or strikes have been in solidly Republican states, but with Colorado, a mostly Democratic state joins the movement. The big issue in all of these states is that teachers generally earn less and have fewer benefits than other college graduates. But is low pay the main issue here? And why is the movement gaining momentum now? Joining me to explore these issues is Nagin Oliyai. Nagin is a researcher at the Institute for Policy Studies and edits the blog inequality.org, where she recently wrote an analysis of the teacher strikes. Thanks for joining us, Nagin. Thanks for having me. So first off, just how bad do teachers in the US have it? Lawmakers in some of the states where strikes have taken place have tended to dismiss the seriousness of the situation. For example, uh, Oklahoma Governor Mary Fallon compared them to a teenager who wants a new car. What's your response to such comments? So uh, to Mary Fallon's comments, um, I would say that's just patently ridiculous. Uh, so first of all, the Economic Policy Institute has pointed out what they call the teacher pay gap which is to say that in every single state in this country, teachers make less than other workers with a comparable education. Teachers are more likely than other workers to hold a second job. And when you look at those comments that are coming from people like Governor Fallon, uh, there's, there's pretty direct correlation between that and some corporate funders who are looking to uh, remove public funding for education. So for example, the State Policy Network, uh, which is a, a conservative um, think, a series of conservative think tanks that are active in states, they have this, uh, they issued this like messaging platform that suggested, you know, uh, calling out things like this and, and creating language like this when it's just not true. Teachers really are getting paid less. And I would say that it's not just about teachers pay. It's also about public education funding as a whole. So, uh, for example, in Oklahoma, teachers haven't gotten a raise for a decade. But in addition to that, classes are only four days a week in many of those districts. So it's not just about salaries. It's not just about benefits, but it's really about the priorities that the state legislators have. And they're not really interested in funding public education or letting teachers have a livable wage. And meanwhile, while they're also expected to contribute more towards their health care um, in West Virginia, which is where some of these strikes really started to kick off. Uh, one of the kind of like the, the straws that broke the camel's back was that they requested the legislators uh, toss out an idea that would have teachers putting on like a Fitbit, uh, downloading an app that would track their movements to uh, reduce their cost of health insurance. And if they didn't do so, then they'd have to pay an extra charge at the end of the year. So they're really getting creative and desperate to try and find ways to cut teacher salaries. And it's it, it's it's quite offensive for Governor Fallon to say something like that when it, there's plenty of evidence that says that teachers are really being underpaid. That's really quite amazing. Uh, how did it happen, though, that uh, teacher pay and benefits uh, and public education cutbacks have been so extreme? Has it always been uh, this way, or is this a recent development? Uh, I'd say it's a, it's a quite some time in the making. Uh, a lot of people point to around 2008. Uh, the numbers of the education funding numbers from around the time of the recession. Uh, and to, to be honest, a lot of this is really about tax cuts that are kind of predate that as well. So for example, in Oklahoma, they really gave uh, oil and gas companies some major tax cuts um, decades ago. And they just, uh, they, they decided to uh, go back on that after the teacher protests, but they really slashed their budgets so hard. That that's really what, what caused all these, um, these education funding shortfalls. Uh, in West Virginia, where the, the, these current, this current bout of strikes really took off, uh, they slashed the corporate rate and they did away with several other taxes, which led to which brought them their revenue by about $400 million a year, more than that, uh, according to the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy. And then to top that off, in West Virginia, the governor is the richest man in the state, and he's not even paying his own taxes. So his companies have, um, have had liens on them for not paying taxes in both his home state and in states like Kentucky, which is also seeing teacher strikes. So it's really a choice. It's a priority uh, to give tax cuts to the wealthy and to give tax cuts to corporations and to companies that are interested in exploiting natural resources and not give those to public education. So it's not like this is like a budget crisis that is not by design. This is, this is, a, this is a political choice. You mentioned that uh, this recent wave of uh, strikes ha began in West Virginia, which was uh, back in February. Um, but uh, in your article, you also talk about a longer history of resistance to these kinds of uh, uh, or to, to these kinds of cutbacks and to, to the miserable situation of teachers. Can you tell us a little bit more about how far back this movement goes? 
Yeah, absolutely. I really want to point out the 2012 Chicago teacher strikes. Uh, when those teacher strikes happened, um, the, a group of, within the Chicago Teachers Union, the Caucus of Rank and File Educators, kind of took over and they really forced uh, the union and politicians to expand their idea of what teacher strikes could look like and what an education movement could look like. So rather than just focusing on issues like salary, benefits, hours, they expanded it to look at things like after school programs, to look at um, investment in the community and where that money could come from as well. Uh, and that was really momentous that really changed the idea of what collective bargaining could look like within a community And they brought the community into the process as well So they had the backing of parents who were out there marching with them uh, And and they saw some really great gains and that's kind of continued that idea has continued on uh, in recent years Another another example I would like to point out is the Detroit teachers uh, sick outs in 2016 where they left uh, the classroom because the, the classrooms were infected with black mold, they had rats, they didn't have heat in the winter. And so they made this about educational justice. This wasn't about uh, salary. This was about the, the working conditions for themselves and then the learning conditions for their students. And even in St. Paul, where uh, just before the West Virginia teachers went on strike, uh, they decided that they, they voted to authorize a strike. They didn't ultimately end up going on strike. But one of the things that they really pointed to was that the Super Bowl was about to happen in their city or in the Twin Cities. And uh, the amount of money that was going into the funding the Super Bowl and building a brand new stadium for the football players, that could have been invested into the communities. And they really called out some specific companies that could be doing more to pay more taxes that can invest in the students. Lawmakers generally respond to teacher demands for better pay by saying that there just is not enough money in the state budgets to pay them more. How can, can and do teachers respond to this? Uh, one of the really interesting things that's been coming out of this wave of teacher strike is that they've been looking at some of the, they've been, they've been offering some revenue raisers. So for example, in Oklahoma, um, long before the strikes actually happened, teachers have been pushing to raise the oil and gas production taxes that had, and the lowering of these taxes was really what underfunded the education sector in that state in the first place. Uh, same thing in West Virginia, uh, when they were, when the strikes were happening, there was some talk about it going out of a Medicaid budget and the West Virginia teachers said that's not gonna happen. Uh, and they provided some other options like capital gains taxes, uh, or reducing like capital gains deductions. And uh, while that's still sort of being worked out, it's it's been something that is interesting to watch because it's not just about saying that we want more money for us, it's about having more equity in the community. And so they've been point all these teachers in all of these states have been kind of pointing out that corporations have the money to pay for the to fully fund this education sector. The states have the money. And as I mentioned, it's a choice. It's a choice to underfund these areas. It's a choice to underfund these public services and public education. And so they've really made that clear. Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there for now, but we'll definitely want to come back uh, as these uh, strikes continue to develop. I was speaking with Negin Ovidaye, a researcher at the Institute for Policy Studies who edits the blog inequality.org. Thanks again for being here, Nagin. Thanks so much for having me. And I'm Greg Wilpert for The Real News Network.